Good morning, everybody. Check one, two, three. Welcome to our outdoor service. It's good to see all of you. I gotta hit this way. In a, about 30 seconds, we're gonna start the service by singing and worshiping. So make sure you grabbed one of our lyric sheets right over to your right, my left, on that black table by the folding chairs. That is a lyric sheet that will have the words to these songs. So, all of you in the back that are still talking, we're gonna get started. Let me pray for us, and then we'll turn things over to Amber Joy. Father God, we are so thankful for a beautiful summer day. We are thankful for this church. We are thankful for you, who through Jesus Christ have called each one of us to your side. We now pray that you would come here and overwhelm us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, let's stand and worship together. Where's my iPad? Waiting for my tempo.
just want to encourage myself and everybody here and everyone who is watching at home to really engage your mind and your heart right now. Let's be so very present in what we're doing. Um, let's let these words sink in and let's let them oh, just bring us to life in a fresh this morning.
Jesus, no one can take us away from you. Nothing can separate us. You are in our lives. You are there for us. You walk beside us. And because of these things, I just pray that our hearts would turn to you and fully 100% trust you. Amen. So I don't know what you're facing today or what you're needing to put into his hands. But as we sing this song, just in your hearts, in your minds, give him what you need to trust him with today. let us down, that you will always be there for us. Help us to trust you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And why don't you stand up and just say hi, even though I just told you to be seated. Uh, we haven't had a greeting yet, so say hello, and what is your favorite part of summer?
All right, everybody, let's go ahead and continue with our service today. Man, it's good to see everybody here. If we have never met each other, my name is Mike. I am the Worship and Operations Pastor. Before we jump into today's message, I've got a couple quick announcements. First, you notice this beautiful t-shirt that I am wearing. Would you like one of these for free? You have 24 hours to get yourself signed up. So, Vacation Bible Camp is coming. It's two weeks away, but tomorrow is our cutoff for volunteers. We really need a few more helpers, so Steve sent me some notes. Uh, we, first, we need some people that are willing to do some cookies and snacks for our volunteers during the week of VBC. Now look, let's be honest, I'm a guy. Anybody can run to Costco and buy 200 cookies, but homemade are so much better. And our volunteers, they're working three or four hours a night, five days in a row. So the least we can do is give them some cookies. So if you're willing to make some cookies anytime during VBC week, please get a hold of Pastor Steve. Second, we're doing something really cool. We're partnering with another church, Trinity Lutheran, and sharing all of the VBC decorations, all the sets. They've been spending a lot of time building stuff. So Trinity goes first. You know what that means is we need help on August. Well, this says August. I think he meant July. July 30th and 31st, we need a few volunteers just to help get all the decorations from Trinity Lutheran set up here. So if you're able to help out for that, guess what you do? Contact Pastor Steve. And finally, if you have signed up to volunteer, t-shirts are available. You can get yours today right after church is over. Now, well, there goes my sticky note. So today I get the privilege of kicking off a brand new series that's going to take us from now through the rest of summer. And we're calling this series Trust the Process. Now you may or may not know where the phrase trust the process came from. Thanks, Jay. I was just going to leave it there actually, but you the man. Everybody say hi to Jay. Jay does an awesome job keeping our facilities looking clean. So trust the process is a phrase that's been around a while, but it really gained popularity over the last few years by an NBA basketball team named the Philadelphia 76ers. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? So the Philadelphia 76ers went through a four year period in 2013 through 2017 where they were just plain awful. In that four year period, they finished second to last, second to last, dead last, and second to last. In fact, in that four year stretch, I looked it up, they had a record of 75 wins and 253 losses. You know what the worst part is? They were doing it on purpose. Now, the players that were playing the games, they weren't trying to lose on purpose. But the front office and those that were in charge of putting the roster together made sure they had a roster that wasn't very good. Now, the million dollar question is what? Why? Why? Well, if you don't follow sports, in the NBA, every year they have what's called a draft lottery. And the lottery is for teams to take players from anywhere, college or overseas. And there's an order of who gets the first pick. And that order is determined by who finished with the worst record. So if you get the worst record, you have the best chance to get the first draft pick. So what they were doing is they were basically tanking on purpose for four years. Meanwhile, they were trying to draft really good players. And it was during this four year stretch that it was actually a bunch of their fans. And then the team caught on that they coined this phrase, trust the process. In fact, they would even chant it at games as they were on their way to losing a record number of games. Trust the process, which is kind of comical. But basically what they were saying is, even though things look really, really bad right now, we have a plan in place to get better. You've just got to trust the process. So you could argue whether it worked or not. Uh, every year since 2017, the Philadelphia Sixers have made the playoffs. In fact, this last season, they finished with the number one record in the Eastern Conference. However, they did get bounced. They're not going to win the title, but they do have a couple of the best players in the NBA. 
Yeah, go Bucks. Go Bucks. I don't know. I'm more of a Suns guy myself, but. So you can probably already know where we're going with this series. All throughout Scripture, we can see examples of where God's people went through times where things looked really, really bad, things looked really grim, and they had to trust God's process. So I was thinking about this word trust. Uh, trust is a very funny word. It's really easy to say, and I think it's easy to, to understand cognitively, and yet very few of us, myself included, really live lives where we experience the power of this word trust. You see, trust requires us to do something that's almost impossible to do. It requires us to not rely on our own strategies, on our own thoughts, on what we see, on what we think is best, but it requires us to put all that aside and go with somebody else's ideas. This is why we always say, what's the best teacher experience, right? It shouldn't be, but the reality is no matter how many times I tell you don't do this or do that, you're probably going to have to make your own mistakes before you'll learn. You know, there's a true story uh, in 1859, and most of you, many of you have maybe heard this story, a man named Charles Blondin back in 1859. He walked across Niagara Falls, and he did it on a tightrope. He did it on a tightrope while blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow. So he goes back and forth, and the crowd is ooing and aahing, of course. And then he posed the question, how many of you think that I could push somebody across in the wheelbarrow? Of course, everybody said yes. So then he asked the million dollar trust question. All right, raise your hand if you are willing to get in the wheelbarrow. I think he was met with a lot of silence. So my question is, if nobody gets in the wheelbarrow, are they really trusting Charles Blondin? You see, it's really easy to say, I believe you can do it, but it's a whole nother level of trust to actually get in the wheelbarrow. I think trust is a funny thing. When we are born, we are hardwired to trust, right? Infants, babies, toddlers even, maybe preschoolers, maybe kindergartners, they're hardwired to blindly trust their parents for everything. But then a funny thing happens. Those toddlers become elementary age students, then they become pre-teenagers. I have one in my home. Then they become teenagers, then they become college students, then they become young adults. And somewhere along the way, their trust takes a big dip downwards. Then you become adults, which most of us are. And I think as adults, our ability to trust is at its most difficult. Because as adults, we've experienced pain. We've experienced heartache. We've experienced really, really difficult situations that we didn't have answers for. We've gone through times when maybe we felt helpless and hopeless, and it becomes really, really difficult to trust. And then we come across verses like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that tell us to trust God with all of our heart and not to lean on the way we understand things, on what we see, on our strategies, on our plans. We're supposed to set all that aside and in everything acknowledge him, which really means make Christ first, lean onto him, and then he will make your paths straight. We all want straight paths, but there is a condition to those straight paths. The condition is that we trust God, not just with belief, but with our actions. I mean, we read that even demons have belief and they shudder but they're missing something. They don't put action to their belief. The condition to the straight paths is trust. And I believe that just like jumping into the wheelbarrow requires action, that we can trust God even in our doubts. Let me say that again. You don't have to remove all doubt to trust God. Think about it. Who trusts Blondin? The person who says, I believe you can do it, no doubt about it, 100% guarantee, but they don't get in the wheelbarrow. Or the person who says, yeah, that's scary. I am not sure you could push me across in the wheelbarrow. To be honest, this could be catastrophic, but you know what? I'm willing to get in. Let's do it. Which one of those people trusts God or trusts Blondin? Is it not the second person? who put their trust in him even while they doubted 
and had fears and reservations. So over the next six or seven weeks, we are going to focus on stories from scripture of people who had to trust the process or trust in God during very difficult situations. So my encouragement for you is to engage with us during, during this whole series, to show up, to challenge your ideas of what it means to trust in God. And maybe you're in one of those seasons where you have to trust in him and it's really hard to do the action. So I'm hoping that today's lesson is going to encourage all of us. So before we jump into today's story, let's pray. Father God, I love that song that we just finished singing that really says that we will trust in you no matter what we see, no matter what we feel, no matter what we're going through. I will trust, I will trust in you. And Lord, I pray for my life and for our lives that our trust would not just be belief, but that it would be followed with actions. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to jump into today's Trust the Process lesson. And it is an amazing woman in scripture named Esther. So if you brought your Bible or your Kindle or whatever you have, feel free to open up to the book of Esther. But let me set the backdrop before we jump into this story. Let's do a little 100,000 foot overview. So the story of Esther occurs approximately 483 BC. Now it was about 100 years before that, in about 583 BC, that God used King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to punish the Israelites. The Israelites had forsaken him, and he used Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon to attack and conquer Jerusalem and promptly exile a whole lot of Jews to Babylon. This period is known as the Babylonian exile. So sometime after that, maybe 50 years or so, before Esther, Cyrus the Great, who is the king of Persia, he then comes and defeats Babylon. And if you remember, it's Cyrus who issues a decree that allows Ezra and any Jews who wish to return to Jerusalem and to begin rebuilding the temple. Now eventually Cyrus dies and Darius takes over. He allows the work on the temple to continue and eventually he dies and a king named Xerxes becomes the king of Persia. And it's at this time that the story of Esther takes place. Now, the story of Esther focuses on a group of Jews who live in a place called Susa in Persia. And these are Jews who are still living in exile. So just to finish this little history lesson, it's after Xerxes dies when King Artaxerxes uh, becomes king. And this is the time period when Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem and oversees completion of the wall. And it was during the time of Nehemiah that Malachi was God's prophet. And shortly after that, a period of 400 years passes, uh, often known as the silent years or the intertestamental time. And this is a time when we don't have in our scriptures any recorded new revelations. No new prophets were sent. And a little bit later this summer, I'm going to be able to bring another message that focuses on that intertestamental time. So why am I sharing this little bit of history with you? Well, the title of this series is Trust the Process. And the big idea is simply that God is always at work. God is always at work. Now, I just gave us a 100,000-foot level overview of some of what was going on during that time. Now, imagine to the people that were living through it, this was incredibly difficult. They must have felt like God had forsaken them, that he was distant, that he'd forgotten, that he was no longer involved in their lives. I think it's easy for us to look back at history and see how God was at work. But I think there's a reminder for all of us uh, in this that, that God is always at work. So before we jump into this story... Uh, another very interesting thing that you may or may not know about the book of Esther, it is the only book in the entire Bible where God, Yahweh, is not mentioned a single time. He's not mentioned a single time. In fact, there are no recorded miracles in the story of Esther. Now, you've heard me re refer, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis in his works, The Chronicles of Narnia. And in that series, there's actually one of the books called The Horse and His Boy. And C.S. Lewis got his idea straight from Esther, because in that story, the horse and his boy, 
It's the lion Aslan that is never mentioned a single time. Yet in that story, it is Aslan who is always behind the scenes, moving and working to bring things the way he wants. And so it is that we're going to see in the story of Esther that even though God is not mentioned, it is definitely God moving behind the scenes to orchestrate everything the way he wants to. So this leads me to my first main point today. And yes, I'm making my first main point before we even start the story of Esther. And I've already said it a couple times, but it's this. Point number one of three is this. God is always at work. Now, everybody say that with me out loud. Ready? God is always at work. Now say it like you believe it. God is always at work. You know, at times in our lives, uh, we often feel like we don't hear God or that we don't see God. And we might feel that he's distant from us or he's not answering the prayers that we want him to. Or we read the news and we see things going on in the world that we cannot comprehend and make sense of. We go, God, why? And it's at those times when he doesn't give us the answers that it's really important for us to remember, God is always at work. He doesn't always tell us what he's doing when we want to know, but he is always at work. This reminds me of a song that we've sung here called Waymaker. And there's a lyric in that song that says, even when I don't see you, you're working. Even when I don't feel you, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. And that is a really important truth for us to remember. All right, we're gonna jump into the story. Uh, in this story of Esther, there are four main characters. Number one is the character Esther. You'll never guess that she is the hero of the story an amazing woman who lived an amazing life. Then we have the character Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is Esther's cousin. Uh, when Esther was young, she became an orphan, and Mordecai takes Esther in and raises her as his own daughter. It's funny as a little side note. There's a lot of confusion about Mordecai, whether it was he his uncle, was she a niece, was he a cousin? Well, I'm here to set the record straight. I did my research. They were cousins, okay? They were cousins, but Mordecai was as a father to her. Mordecai is also a hero. In fact, if you read the whole story, you'll see that it was Mordecai, Mordecai's advice that Esther leans on over and over again. Then we have King Xerxes. He's the king of Persia. He has all the power. He's an able war leader. However, he's got a ton of flaws. And the best way to describe King Xerxes is this quote I read. One author said, Xerxes was known for his drinking, his extravagant banquets, his punitive temper, his sexual appetite. He was arrogant, controlling, self-important, manipulative, insecure, and proud. And I don't think I have anything to add to that description of Xerxes. <laughs> then we have Haman. Haman is most definitely the villain. He is the bad guy. He hates all of the Jews, and he especially despises Mordecai. So in chapter 1, the story begins with Xerxes, Xerxes hosting two elaborate feasts. Now, how many of you have ever been part of a really great feast? Come on. A wedding banquet, a reception, great meal, right? For us, a really incredible feast might last two or three hours, right? Or maybe a whole evening. Well, Xerxes has two feasts, and the two feasts together last 187 days. That's right. They spent over half a year drinking and partying. And you know what the purpose of these feasts was? To show everybody how great and glorious he was. So they have two feasts, and it's on the last day of the feast, day 187, that he is a little bit intoxicated, no duh. And it's at this point that he sends for Queen Vashti so he can show off her beauty. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there's only one reason he called for Queen Vashti, and it wasn't any holy great reason. He was wanting to show her off in a very unflattering way to his guests. Now, Vashti refuses to come, and I don't know much about Vashti, but I say good for her for not showing up. And she is promptly deposed as the queen. Xerxes then gets persuaded to enact a law that basically says, 
Women are never allowed to disobey their husbands ever again. Husbands are the rulers of their home. They rule with an iron fist. What they say goes, men are in charge. I mean, how dare his wife refuse to be paraded around in front of all of his drunk guests. So in chapter two, Xerxes, of course, has a problem now. He has no queen. He has no woman to show off to all these amazing people. So he begins looking for a new queen, and guess what his number one criteria was? Their beauty. The only thing he cared about is how pretty they were, their looks. I mean, forget character, he just wants a queen who is physically attractive. So he basically holds a beauty pageant in the entire empire of Persia. Surprise, surprise, it is, it is Esther who gets chosen to be part of this little contest and she hides her Jewish identity all along. She wins and she is chosen to become the next queen. Meanwhile, in chapter two, we also see that as this is going on, it's Mordecai who uncovers a plot to assassinate King Xerxes. He reports the plot to uh, Queen Esther and Esther informs King Xerxes. Xerxes captures the conspirators and they are promptly executed. And you can pause right here and already note that you already see God moving in this story. Like pawns on a chessboard, he is already putting people in positions to accomplish his ultimate plan to save his people. In chapter three, we get introduced to Haman. Now, interestingly enough, I'll be honest, I didn't actually know this till I studied. Did you know Haman was not from Persia? Haman is a descendant of the Canaanites. The same Canaanites we see that are enemies of God's people all throughout the Old Testament. So it's no surprise that Haman does not like Mordecai or the Jews. But Haman gets elevated to the highest position in the kingdom, second only to the king himself. And Haman, being the upstanding fine young man that he is, he promptly makes a decree that everybody must bow down to him. Not bow down to Xerxes, but bow down to him. So Mordecai refuses, and once Haman finds out about Mordecai's Jewish roots, he convinces the king to enact a decree to not just destroy Mordecai, but to destroy all of the Jewish people in Persia. To determine the day that they're going to be killed, he rolls a dice called the Pur. Remember that name, it'll come back at the end, the Pur. And you'll never guess what they decide to do to celebrate this new decree. That's right, they have another feast or a drinking party, as I will say. So then the story turns to chapters four and five, and these are the two main chapters that we're gonna focus on this morning. In chapter four, the focus of the story turns to Mordecai and Esther. Now the very first thing we see in chapter four is Mordecai and all of the Jews, they show great humility when they find out what's happened. And they do this, we see these phrases at times in scripture, sackcloth and ashes, right? Weeping and wailing. And every single time you see this in scripture, it refers to people of God humbling themselves before Yahweh. When, when something bad is happening or about to happen, it is a sign of great humility. Esther wants to find out, of course, what is troubling Mordecai. And once she hears about the plot to destroy the Jews, she and Mordecai devise a plan to approach the king where Esther plans to reveal her Jewish identity to him and ask that the decree be reversed. Now, there's just one catch. Nobody is allowed to approach the king without being invited. And if you approach the king without being invited, the punishment is death. That's right. And it's at this point, remember who King Xerxes is. He's not this incredibly humble, benevolent dictator who's always looking out for the best of the people he leads. He's an egotistical, sexist, drunkard with a temper tantrum. How do you think Esther feels about possibly approaching him uninvited? Not very good. So let us read a little bit and see what happens. So I'm in chapter four, verse 11. If you want to follow along, you're free. All the king's officials, this is Esther speaking. 
all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So stop right there for a minute and just imagine, put yourself in Esther's shoes for a minute. She knows that she's of Jewish origin. She knows that Haman is the highest in command, second only to the king, and Haman despises the Jews. She knows that King Xerxes is not a great husband, is not a great leader, is not a great person in any way, shape, or form. How do you think you would feel if you knew what was being asked of you? And also remember, it's not like Queen Esther has been groomed her entire life to take on this kind of responsibility. I see her more as an innocent person who just gets caught up into this great adventure and suddenly she finds herself with the whole world hanging on her shoulders. Mordecai has very little sympathy for Esther, though. Look at his response in verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's the key section. In these verses, a couple of things jump off the page to me. First, Mordecai's unwavering faith. He is 100% confident that God is going to deliver the Jews. Now, there's a little um, uncertainty whether Mordecai was referring that God was going to deliver the Jews in Susa right then and there if Esther didn't step up. Or what I think is Mordecai knew Esther was kind of their only hope. And if she didn't step up, they were likely all going to be killed. But I think Mordecai was looking long term. Relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from somebody else. If you don't act in this moment right now, don't think you're going to be spared. God will still redeem his people in his plans. The second thing that jumps off the page to me is Mordecai believes that this is the very reason Esther was made to be queen. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So this leads me to our second big point today. Your lives and our lives are not a coincidence. Say that with me. My life is not a coincidence. The first point was what? Anybody remember? God is always at work. And so it follows that your life and mine are not a coincidence. Just pause for a minute, church. Think about these words and the power in them. For such a time as this. What if we woke up every morning and looked at our lives that way? I thought about that. I'm a pastor here at North Lake, and in my 16 years here, this church has gone through lots of ups and downs, lots of transitions. I got hired to do nothing but music, and before I knew it, I was doing all sorts of other stuff, and here I am up here giving a message this morning. But what if I'm called to be a pastor at North Lake Community Ch Church on 1471 McLeod for such a time as this, in this moment in this year? I thought too, I'm a father, my son Brennan right there. I'm a husband, my wife Julie. I'm also a son, I'm a son-in-law, I'm a brother-in-law, I'm an uncle, I'm a cousin for such a time as this. All of us, teachers, electricians, business women and businessmen, pastors and missionaries, stay-at-home moms and career moms, whatever you are, wherever you are, wherever you work, whatever you do, what if you looked at your life as you were put there by God, not by accident, not by coincidence, but for such a time as this? I thought too, I live in a cul-de-sac called Angela Court. I've got a bunch of neighbors. We know them pretty well now. I know a couple of them that are believers, but the rest, as far as I can tell, are far from God. What if Julie and Brennan and I were put there, not by accident, 
not by coincidence, but for such a time as this. I think if we lived our lives through that lens, it would change. I know for me it would mean there's no days off. Now that doesn't mean there's no resting time. It just means there's no days off. Every day, what I have planned before me is in God's hands, and he is going to orchestrate my day for such a time as this. There's two ways to look at our lives. One, a bunch of things happen by coincidence and luck. Or two, God ordained moments will he, where he will direct us where he wants us. I was thinking back a number of years ago, long before I met Julie, and I was very passionate about this game called golf. Uh, growing up in high school and college, I loved to play golf. In fact, I got a job working on a golf course. And there was a period in time where I was contemplating a future in the golf industry. Now, don't get me wrong, I was never good enough to like be a playing professional. But you can become a licensed PGA professional and just focus your career on teaching, on coaching, and working at a golf course. In fact, I remember at one point I visited a course in Spokane, Washington. And after leaving there, I got offered a job by the head golf professional there. He was basically offering to take me under his wing, teach me everything he knew, and put me on a track to have a career in the golf industry. So I came home, and I thought about it, and I prayed about it. My faith wasn't then what it is now, but I still always believed in a God. And after praying about it, I felt that I knew what God's answer was. So I picked up the phone, and guess what I said? I said, thanks for the offer. I'll take the job. My answer is yes. When do I start? You know what the response was? You're about two hours too late. We hired somebody else. Now, I ask you, is that coincidence? Is that luck? Was that just some little blip? You know, my faith wasn't very strong then, but I never looked at it that way. I was like, well, okay. Because you know what, what else was happening at that time? Uh, a very young, insecure person with very little confidence was being hounded by the head music director at Bellevue Community College, basically saying, Mike, what is with you? You have incredible musical gifts. Get in here and help us help you. Let us help you. That's just one of many things I could point to in my life. God is always at work. Our lives are not a coincidence. And I'm guessing if we pass the microphone around, many of you could look back on moments in your life that maybe at the time it seemed like a coincidence or luck, but looking back, you realize, no, this was God directing me. All right, we left Esther hanging in a very difficult situation, so let's see what happens. Verse 15, Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This brings me to point number three. True faith requires action. True faith requires action. The key word is action. What is faith after all? Is it simply believing? No, it's not. True faith must include actions. Just like Blondin can walk a tightrope with somebody in the wheelbarrow, only if somebody is willing to jump in are they showing true faith in him. So it is that Esther has to make a decision here whether to act on her faith and trust in God, even in the midst of her doubts. Esther, I might add, has demonstrated incredible faith, not just belief, but she is willing to put her very life on the line. Notice something else. Her words, if I perish, I perish. Think about what those words mean. Those words mean that she is not 100% confident that God is going to come through for her. Why would she say, well, if I die, I die? You know what she did do, do though? She and all her people spent three days, day and night, fasting and going before the Lord to seek his favor. But ultimately, when it comes to the moment to act, she still isn't sure. If I perish, I perish. Why am I pointing this out? 
because I think many of us feel like true faith removes all fears and doubts. I don't agree with this. And I could point to many, many passages in Scripture, many people in Scripture who were called to action even in the midst of fear or doubt. They trusted God by acting decisively even in the midst of doubts and fears. People ultimately showed that they trusted him. Esther is an amazing woman, and she sets the example for us, taking action despite her fears and doubts. So from this point on in chapter 5, the whole story pivots. Basically, every single plan that Haman had laid out is going to go exactly the opposite of what he intended. So I'm in chapter 5 and verse 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and he held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Again, who do you think moved in Xerxes' heart? to be gentle and generous towards Queen Esther? I think we know the answer. So let's do a speed finish through the rest of the story, and then we're going to circle back. Esther goes on to invite Haman and Xerxes to a banquet, and the point of the banquet is kind of comical, is basically to get them a little tipsy and invite them to another banquet the following night. And I might add, I think Esther is smarter than we give her credit for. I think she knows if she gets these guys a little bit tipsy, not just one night, but two nights, that things are more likely to go her way. Now, in between banquet number one and banquet number two, a couple of interesting things happen. First, Haman leaves the banquet drunk, and who should he bump into but Mordecai? Mordecai, who once again refuses to bow down to him. So what does Haman do? He immediately orders a giant stake to be made where Mordecai is going to be impaled on it. Now, in a lot of your English translations, it might use the word gallows, uh, indicating maybe hanging. But I did a lot of research, and it looks like most likely the form of execution was basically a giant tree or a giant pole to be erected and literally impale Mordecai on it. The second interesting thing that happens is King Xerxes has a bit of insomnia. He can't sleep, so he asks that the rule of his reign be read to him. I might just point out, is there a more egotistical thing to do? It's like, I can't sleep. Why don't you read to me the history of how great my kingdom is so I can fall asleep to it? But interestingly enough, again, is this a coincidence or is this God moving? he gets read to him the part where Mordecai saves his life by reporting the conspiracy. And uh, Xerxes asks if anything was ever done to honor Mordecai. And of course, nothing was ever done. So at this point in the story, it's funny, uh, Haman comes the next morning planning to ask for Mordecai to be impaled. And what should happen but the exact opposite. Xerxes calls Haman in and says, not only do you not have permission to kill Mordecai, but I want you to honor Mordecai, to put royal robes on him, put him on a chariot, and march around the city proclaiming how great Mordecai is to anyone who will listen. Haman is obviously completely and totally humiliated, and it's at this point in the story that even Haman's wife and friends pick up, Haman, you are ruined because you are going up against the Jewish God. So all that happens in between the two banquets. The second banquet comes along where Esther reveals her own Jewish identity, and then she reveals that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her, to murder Mordecai, and to murder all of the Jews. As you can imagine, Xerxes, who is by now really drunk, his temper is ignited, and he promptly orders Haman to be impaled on the very stake he made to kill Mordecai. Now in chapter eight, the story isn't quite done as the king is unable to revoke the decree that he already made. So instead he gives Mordecai the authority to make a counter decree that all Jews on the appointed day of their death, the 13th of Adar, are now ordered to defend themselves and in fact to kill anyone who had opposed them. 
So the appointed day comes and the Jews first destroy all of Haman's family and enter any other Persian officials who were part of the plot. And then they go on uh, to destroy everyone who had plotted against them. And we, can, we read that some 75,000 enemies of the Jews were killed on that day. Mordecai uh, records all of these events, and he commemorates a two-day feast. And, and I didn't know this too, but to this very day, this two-day feast, which is called uh, the Feast of Purim, is still celebrated. It's celebrated on the Hebrew month in the Hebrew month of Adar on the 14th and 15th days. So this past year, that was March 16th and 17th. So the book concludes with Mordecai being elevated to the second in command in the kingdom, and the Jews now thrive while in exile in Persia. So let's try to wrap things up. Is this a story about Mordecai and Esther saving the Jews? Well, yes and no. It is a story about how God saved the Jews through them. But when we stop and take a look at the whole story, what we see is a whole bunch of twists and turns, and as one person put it, ironic reversals, all of which are orchestrated by God. I love that this story is included in scripture, as it highlights the fact that even when we don't see God working in our lives, we know that God is always at work. It reminds us, too, that he can use anyone in any position to accomplish his purposes. Earlier, I mentioned that this is the only book in the Bible where God is not mentioned by name. Not only that, but there are no recorded miracles. And yet this is a story where God is the mover of everything behind the scenes. After all, who was it that Esther, Mordecai, and all the Jews were fasting to? Who was it that they put on sackcloth and ashes and weeping and wailing and mourning to? Was it not to God, to Yahweh? One author I read put it this way. The book of Esther records no miracles and no direct intervention of God at all. In Esther's story, the Lord redeems his people through the faith and courage of one strategically placed woman and her cousin. All the while, things are happening behind the scenes to bring about the final result. It got me thinking, sometimes those times in our lives when God appears not to be working, who knows but that he isn't busy orchestrating something behind the scenes, waiting for something to happen in order to bring you the answer that you are waiting for. Now, I was chatting about this topic with a couple of our staff, and they reminded me too, so often I think we tend to look at our lives as, what is God doing for me? What great thing is he wanting me to do? Forgetting that there's this giant story going on from Genesis to heaven. And God is busy using us as individuals, yes, but we are part of this immense story. And so often we get lost in our interpersonal things, expecting God to always show us everything we want to see. So how do we wrap this up? Let me read for you a verse out of Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I love the point Paul makes here. Two simple words, living, because I'm looking around and every single one of you is still alive. And sacrifice, because a sacrifice basically means we are giving something to God, an offering to God. So we are all called to be a living sacrifice. So to drive this point even further, I love how Eugene Peterson wrote this verse in the message. Listen to this. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. So a week ago, Saturday morning, I was sitting on my deck with my puppy on my lap, having some time with the Lord. And I hadn't yet finished the end of this message and I wasn't sure how to wrap things up. And I was going through the U version that morning, reading the story part. And I read these words and it nailed it. I'm like, that is perfect. That is the point I'm trying to make 
what I hope you walk away with. So let me read to you what I read a week ago. A couple of years ago, large numbers of people in our community came to faith. Many came as a result of catalytic evangelists who spent their time on the streets helping people say yes to God. Initially, everyone applauded and soon they wanted to be involved too. What ensued was a wonderful reorienting of lives beyond ourselves, but the subtle shift that accompanied this was not healthy or helpful at all. People began to believe that the real work of the kingdom was only happening in the streets. It wasn't long before some began questioning the relevance and significance of their lives at work. It felt mundane rather than meaningful. After all, nobody ever tells stories from stages of spreadsheets or of cleaning or of work done well. But servants are not stolen from the workplace. They are sent to the workplace. The kingdom is not an escape from real work. It's an engagement with real work. Kingdom carriers are jewelers and gardeners, carpenters, bricklayers, shopkeepers and engineers, lawyers and doctors, architects and designers. If we are to fulfill our mandate of bringing life to everything everywhere, we must see everything we do as kingdom work. We must reject the idea that kingdom work happens only in services, on stages, or on street corners. We must instead respond to God's invitation to join him in his work of reshaping the world in ordinary places like shopping malls, farms, factories, homes, and offices. I love that. A reminder that God has called you to follow him with all of your heart and he is now sending you as light into the world for such a time as this. You and I are the light of the world. We are part of God's church. You are the church. The church, as Josh said last week, is God's plan A to bring the gospel to the world. You know what plan B is? There isn't one. There is no plan B. We are called. Yes, some are called to sell everything and go overseas and live as overseas missionaries. Others are called to bring the gospel into the light to the neighborhoods you live in, the workplaces you reside in, the homes that you mother and father and parent in. I wonder if we viewed our lives that way, how things would be different. If we viewed our lives every day that this morning, Father, you are sending me into the world to be a light for you for such a time as this. And then we go through our day with our plans, but we hold them loosely, all the while going, I wonder if God has called me to that person or to this place or to do this act of service in his name. So if I had to sum up the whole message from Esther in one sentence, it would be this. Your life was intentionally planned by a sovereign God for such a time as this. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I confess that I too often forget this. I too often go through my days with blinders on, thinking far too much about myself, my own happiness, and far too little about your mission to bring the gospel to the world. Father, I pray you'd help each one of us who is here, who's watching, or who will hear these words to instead live our lives on a mission, on purpose, for such a time as this. And when you call us to trust in you, not just with belief, but with actions, may we step into those moments, despite our fears, may we step into those moments relying on you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Next week, Pastor Josh will be back and continue this series. I actually don't know which person or persons he's focusing on, but I'm excited because over the next few weeks, you'll get to hear from Josh. You're going to hear from Jacob Dahl. You're going to hear from Pastor Luke. You're going to hear from Pastor Steve. I told Josh I want to do another one of these, so you get to hear from me again later this summer. I can't wait. 
But remember this, as you leave this moment, I don't know what the rest of your day looks like. I know you've all got plans. Hold your plans loosely. And remember that God has called you for such a time as this. So go bring the gospel to wherever you are today. All right, church. God bless you. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday.